In this episode, we're going to continue with our build of an audio tape program loader for the Relay computer. And I have to say that so far, it's gone both amazingly and surprisingly well. In part one, we created a series of clock signal tones on a standard stereo audio cassette. And then we were able to decode those using an audio amplifier and a full bridge rectifier to pulse a clock relay which was then able to drive a multi-step sequencer. So the goal today is to add some data pulses on the second channel of that audio cassette, and then build the hardware to decode that data into our latch bits. Now that we have our audio tone driving the clock from the left channel, we're going to update the Arduino code to add our data tone. And I'll start by adding the data tone frequency, but I'll make it slightly lower in frequency so that we can hear the difference when both tones are playing at the same time. And then I'll just assign another Arduino pin as the output for these new data tones that will connect to the right channel. And then after that, it should be just a matter of adding an additional tone function call for data, and then connecting our right channel speaker to the data pin through a 1K resistor to act as a hard-coded volume control. And then the last step is plug it in, upload the code, and confirm our new data tone. And this is where the concept of read the manual really comes into play. It turns out that the stock Arduino tone function doesn't allow for multiple tones to be played simultaneously. But fortunately, there's an upgraded library by Brett Hagman that solves this very problem. The structure of the replacement function offers a few new methods that provide a much greater degree of control of the tones. So now it's just a matter of upgrading the code and then removing the references to the older functions. Right now, the clock and data are both doing the tones at the same time. So I just want to create an alternate pattern that will differentiate the clock tone from the data tone every few steps. And then it's just a matter of hooking up our new right channel input to the tape unit and recording a very long stretch of this revised clock and tone pattern. The next piece of this puzzle is to create another full bridge rectifier and relay circuit for the right data channel. And I'll start by removing the long leads used for the speaker hookup for the clock, and then use that space to add the rectifier circuit, and finally the new data input relay. And then I just need to get to the back of the amplifier so I can access the right channel speaker output and connect the two leads that make up our new data output lines. And isn't hindsight a wonderful thing? I ended up using the same colors for both the clock and the data speaker wire connections. So just to make it easier, I'm going to add this label to one of the lines. And then it's just connecting those lines to the rectifiers and adding the speaker outputs so we can hear what's going on. Now that the clock and data relays are working, it's time to attach the breadboard and then connect the power, ground, and the clock output back to the input on the sequencer. And then I'll reset the sequencer and give everything a quick test to see that our clock and sequencer are still doing what they should be doing.
And we are now at the point where we have a usable clock and data signals from an audio tape. And that means it's time to get to work on the latch bits. To describe a latch bit, I'll start with a trusty double pole, double throw relay, and then add an LED with a resistor to the normally open pin. If we add a five volt source to the common pin, then the LED will be lit each time the relay coil is energized. To make this a latch, we can feed the normally open back to the coil, and then the circuit will latch or keep the coil energized even if the coil voltage is removed. Now at some point, we will need to clear the latch bits, which means that we'll need to interrupt the power source to the common pin. And we can do this by supplying the 5 volts through the normally closed pin on another relay. And when power is applied to that relay's coil, the circuit is broken, which will clear the latch. And this is the same concept I used in my very first register circuit, which required a separate clear signal each time I wanted to load the register. And while I've since found better designs for the registers in the relay computer, this method works perfectly well here since we do want to load each latch bit independently without overwriting the other bits. So here I have the eight latch bits set up and I've had to spread this across two breadboards since there isn't enough space on one. I have the power input connected to the common pin on the clear relay where that supplies power to the latch bits through the normally closed pin. And I can quickly demonstrate the latching by just supplying some power to the coils on some of these relays. And I'll see if I can reach this one on the other board. Yep. And now that we have these latched, that byte will get written to memory. And we would then reset the latches so they're ready to build the next byte. This is sort of shaping up to what it's going to look like. But at this point, we can't just feed our sequencer steps directly into the latch bits because we also need to consider what's happening with the data input. And for example, if the data was active and this first sequencer step was also active, that's when we'd want to activate the first latch bit. And we can do this by creating a gate that performs a logical AND function between the data value and the corresponding sequencer step. In this case, a data input of one and the sequencer step of one will result in a one being placed in the latch bit. Whereas in the next step, a data input of zero and a one from the sequencer step would result in a zero in the corresponding latch bit. Here we have the new gating circuit where we have these four relays to gate the eight steps and all of the four coils are tied together which are activated by the data line. Then I can connect the output of the first sequencer step to the common pin on the first gating relay. And after that, I'll move our latch bits board into place and connect the normally open output from that same gating relay to the input on the first latch bit. And then it's just a rinse and repeat exercise by connecting all of the remaining sequencer steps to the gates and then through to the latch bits. And now that I'm done visually testing the clock and data output using this alternating pattern, I'm going to set the code back to the original 101 pattern and then record a few cycles back to tape. And I think this will just give us a better representation for the testing of loading the latch bits. This thing is getting more Frankensteinish by the day. Uh, it's growing a bit, so I'll do a quick walkthrough and then we'll take it for a test drive. I'll start with the clock relay that is driven by the left audio channel and it's controlling the sequencer. And then above that we have our new data relay that is driven by the right audio channel. 
and it's activating these gating relays which perform a logical AND between whatever is in the data bit and the current sequencer step and then populating the appropriate latch bits across the bottom here. And then over on the right, we have the clear relay that is driven by the second last step on the sequencer here. So let's inject some audio signals and see if we can build some bytes. Okay, I just wanted to stop the tape before it clears the latch because we are getting the correct pattern loading into our latch bits. And this now represents a complete byte that could be loaded into memory before this clear function occurs. Now, I know I need to test a lot of other patterns, but this is off to a great start. And I wasn't expecting perfection. Uh, I did notice that there were multiple sequencer LEDs lit in each cycle. And I think this is caused by the latch bits back feeding into the sequencer LEDs when the gates are open. And it doesn't seem to be causing any problems, but it does kind of bug me. So I'm gonna go ahead and install some diodes on these inputs for the latch bits just to prevent that from occurring. Now things are going really well, so I'm gonna go ahead and update the program loader to allow us to test any byte patterns that we would see in a typical program. And I'm also going to add some serial outputs to the Arduino code so that we can more easily compare what byte we were expecting to see versus what actually happens. And also, I'm adding a delay at the end of each cycle for testing just to have the time to confirm the byte pattern before it moves on to loading the next one. Our first catch of the day. The expected pattern starts with a zero, but we are seeing the first latch bit being activated. And there's something fishy I'm noticing when the latch bits are being populated. Let's take a look at that again. Yeah, so this extra flicker on this LED should not be happening. And I'm beginning to suspect that this is a timing thing. Let's look again at the clock and the data pulses. Currently, the rising and falling edges of the cycles are aligned. And like we've seen before in our relay computer, this can cause problems because the relays need a few milliseconds to settle when activated or deactivated. And I think we can solve for this by creating a small buffer time around the data pulse. I'll do this by adding a new data delay variable that I can monkey around with during testing, and then adding that delay before and after the data tone. But I'll also have to reduce the overall duration of the data tone itself so that everything adds up to a full cycle that stays aligned with the clock pulses.
All right, I think we're almost there. And Murphy's Law kicked in. It did try to throw us off with some timing issues, but ever since we changed the timing on the pulses, I've run many more tests and it seems to be running just fine. So now there's one more thing that we need to add to this tape program loading monster we've created. And that's some additional sequencer steps to drive the control lines that will write that program byte to memory. Now, this does get a bit more complicated because I'll need to create some special timing pulses using diodes, like we had to do for the relay computer sequencer previously. And then after that, we just need to advance the program counter register so that we're pointed to the next memory location and Hopefully, it should just be rinse and repeat. But for now, I'm really happy with how this is coming along. Quite frankly, it's come a lot farther than I thought it was going to. So I hope you're enjoying the ride on this as well. I have also been trying different speeds, seeing how fast it can go. So I'll leave off with that notorious turbo mode footage. So with that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.